So I will talk about uh, supergravity and in particular uh, UV uh, ultraviolet properties um, and how this is related to something that we heard about earlier today, which is squaring uh, Young Mills theory order by order in the perturb perturbative expansion. So this is work together with um, Sveeburn, uh, John Joseph Carrasco, um, Lance Dixon, Rado Royban, Marco Chiederoli, and uh, Murat Gunaidin. So, so this talk is about calculating scattering amplitudes in, in gravity. Um, so I, I figured I should start with throwing out to you um, how you would do it traditionally, and just to see how, the, how this calculation is very complex, the complexity of it. So if you look in a textbook and you want to calculate scattering amplitude, in some quantum field theory. Well, the way you do it is so you start from Lagrangian. Um, you have some field, you pick um, the vacuum. So this is the Minkowski vacuum here of the metric. And then you deviate small. So you have a small uh, expansion parameter, which is kappa, and then you per perturb around the vacuum. Um, and then you work out the Feynman rules. So here's the propagator, and this is in particular the Donner gauge. Uh, so this has three terms. It's not so bad. It has the usual one over p squared. Uh, but if you look at the higher order terms, they start to look bad. So um, the cubic vertex, well, it doesn't look so bad, but actually this notation is secretly hiding that there's various permutations here over the labels and symmetrization over mu and nu indices. So after you work this out, you have on the order of 100 terms. In fact, it's actually closer to 200, but let's say it's one, on the order of 100 terms. Um, but then there's higher order terms, so the, there's a four-point interaction. This has on the order of 1,000 terms, and so on. It gets worse and worse, and of course, this never ends. Um, so um, if looking, at, looking at this expansion and comparing that to the you know, beauty and elegance of Einstein's construction, you say, well, you know, the per perturbative properties of, of gravity is not so happy. Uh, you rather work on something different, something more elegant. Um, but that's actually misleading. Um, so the family rules are messy because these are uh, objects um, which are determined unphysical quantities. They don't become physical un until you put the external legs to be on shell, and then you get uh, scattering amplitudes. So if you actually look at the physical quantities, um, you see that there is some great simplification. So in particular, we can start by just looking at the free fields, the freely propagating, non-interacting plane waves, which you can also think of as the asymptotic states, of course. Um, and you can see that, well, you have your ordinary plane wave uh, e to the i px, but the tensor structure here is uh, remarkable because it factorizes into two vectors. Um, which you can think of as Young Mills polarization vectors. So these are, um, uh, you can see that this is obviously symmetric. It's also traceless if these are null vectors. And furthermore, it's transverse because the Young Mills polarization ve vectors are transverse. So it has all the properties um, to be a gravitational uh, polarization tensor. Of course, this is just freely propagating, non interacting particles, so no surprise there was great simplification. If you start looking at the interacting theory, though, you see that there's the same kind of simplification. And here, so here you can see that once you start with the three-point amplitude on shell, which you can define for, you can actually have momenta on shell uh, if you have complex momenta. Um, then you see that it factorizes into two pieces. And each piece has a fam familiar structure of uh, three-point vertex and Young-Mills theory. It doesn't have the color structure, it just has the kinematical structure, and it has two copies of it. Um, so as you know, the color structure is anti-symmetric, and similarly, this color structure is anti-symmetric. So if you just had one copy of this, of course, it would be a non-interactive theory. That would be a U1 theory. But in fact, if you have two copies, then the anti-symmetry of each of them compensates such that the whole amplitude is both symmetric and non-vanishing. Um, now, if you know something about massless uh, scattering amplitudes, you actually know that, while well, the three-point amplitude is a bit special because it's actually completely determined by symmetries. 
Poincare symmetry, supersymmetry, um, and so on. So you can say, well, it had to work out because you know it's really constrained by symmetry. Um, but looking at higher point amplitudes, you see the same structure here. So you see that looking at four point gravitational scattering amplitude, it looks like it's a product of two Yang Mills amplitude. And these are color ordered uh, um, amplitudes, the color stripped amplitude. That's not color here. There's some additional factors of Mannes dummy variance that I had to put in in order to get the dimension right and also to avoid overcounting of poles. Uh, but just looking at these simple examples, we can sort of see a pattern here that it seems like gr gravity processes are, in some sense, a square of gauge theory ones. Of course, this has been known for some time. It's been known for almost 30 years by the work of Kwai, uh, Lavellen, and Henry Tai. Um, so these are the KLT relations, uh, which, were motivated, which came fr from string theory, and they were motivated by this um, relation where you can think of a closed string as being two copies of open strings, a left-moving open string and a right-moving open string. Um, so what, what uh, Kawhi, Lavelle, and Ta showed is that you can deform the contour in your in integral over the world sheet in such a way that you can completely decouple the left-moving modes and the right-moving modes. And then you can take, uh, if you wish, you can take the field theory limit and you can get the relationship between a gravitational theory and two Yang Mills theories. And here you have some simple relations. So this is the four-point amplitude, which I had on the previous slide, written in a slightly different way. So now it's two different color orders, and now I multiply by a minus the variant, just uh, a local factor. And you can do the similar thing at five points, then you have two terms, and you can do this to n points. Then you will have n minus three factorial terms in this sum. Uh, it's a bit messy. But the formula exists, uh, it's written down, and it's straightforward in principle. Um, so this is the story at tree level. Uh, but what I will show you today here is that the story goes even beyond that. So um, and this is not proven, but we have plenty of evidence which shows that um, a more suggestive way of thinking of this squaring is that you look at each diagram or each uh, process, each channel separately, and you actually square each channel separately. Of course, you should not square the uh, propagator itself, because then you get um, poles which do not correspond to gravitational poles. So what you should do is you just take the numerator of a Young-Mills diagram, and you square that, and you leave the propagator um, untouched. And the same story, this story actually easily, well, it seems to generalize to higher uh, loop orders. So for example, in this three-loop example, what you should do is you should compute this diagram, and you, you have to do some special uh, consistency conditions that this diagram has to satisfy that it will come back to. But more or less is you have this diagram, and all you do is you just replace it with two copies, or squaring the numerator, and then you obtain a gravitational um, amplitude, or a gravitational diagram. Of course, you have to sum over all diagrams to get the amplitude. Uh, and just to show you a few examples, uh, for example, Let's take just ordinary, pure Yang Mills theory, as written down 60 years ago. And you do this process, write it in this form, and square the numerator of each diagram. Then what you get is actually Einstein gravity uh, coupled to a dilaton and an axion. You have to get these four states here. So there's two gravitons plus and minus helicity. And then you have two scalars. And because you started out with four states, and four times four has to be two. Oh, sorry, two times two has to be four. <laughs> um, however, if you look at the maximally supersymmetric theory, as, as um, uh, Lars Spring uh, showed us earlier today, and that you wrote down many years ago, this actually is it's even nicer, because actually if you do the same thing here, uh, you compute each diagram in this uh, n equals four CPA mill theory, and then you double copy or square each numerator, you land exactly on the maximally supersymmetric uh, gravity. And this was already hinted in, in Lars' talk, where he showed that the states of n equals 8 is exactly the square of the states of n equals 4. Um, so, so we have this technology and to compute scattering amplitudes, and the question is, what do we do with it? Well, a long-standing problem, of course, in gravity is the ultraviolet problem. 
Um, I mean, gravity is a non-renormalizable non theory, um, and this is the origin of, of the statement that gravity, um, well, that we don't know how to write down a point-like theory of gravity, and that gravity is, has something, you know, it's inconsistent with quantum mechanics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the basic problem if you study individual diagrams is that, well, the diagrams diverge. They have ultraviolet singularity. And, and the easiest way to understand that is just to look at the diagram comparing a gravitational diagram side by side to a young Mills diagram. Um, and as I said, uh, you should basically have the same propagator structure in both diagrams. But what you should do is you should basically square each um, three-point vertex or each numerator, which tells you that, well, if you have one derivative or one momenta in each vertex in this diagram, in the young Mills theory, you should have two derivatives or two momenta in the vertex in gravity. And that's also the reason why you need a dimensionful coupling constant, because you're multi you have some extra dimensionful quantity here you need to compensate with uh, something which has the opposite inverse dimension. Um, and now you can immediately see, when you start integrating here, um, that if this is typically logarithmically divergent, this is, of course, badly power divergent. And it gets worse and worse the more vertices you add or the more loop orders you add. And in particular, um, the counting goes that for each loop order you add two vertices. So therefore, you have um, a problem that for each loop order you have uh, P mu to the 2L too many factors of P in the gravitational theory. Um, now, um, so the, of course it's well known that gra gravity is non-renormalizable. Um, and that's the, prob the problem is that then you cannot you know, fix, you cannot hide uh, the divergences under the rug. You have to deal with them explicitly. But it's possible, in principle, it's possible that actually if you do the calculation, and then at the end of the day, when you get the result, it's possible that you actually have something finite. There's no divergence, and then you don't need to hide it. Uh, but if, if that is to happen, well, then all these extra powers of loop momenta that you have in your integral has to be converted to external momenta. So once it's external momenta, it doesn't do any harm because it doesn't participate in the integration. It doesn't go to infinity. The external momenta is just uh, fixed by the incoming momenta of the scattering process. Um, of course, this is a lot. You know, this is a lot to put your hopes into. You know, saying that this has to happen. You know, by some miraculous cancellation. I mean, either it has to be algebraic cancellations when you work out your integrand, or it has to be some integration identities. And that's, that's a lot to hope for, that all of this P here should be converted to all of this K's here. And so naively, you, expect, you don't expect that to happen, and therefore um, people declare, well, you know, it doesn't work. Uh, however, if you look at some explicit examples, so in particular, if you look at this maximally supersymmetric gravity, it turns out that all calculations to date show that this, this process actually takes place. If you actually work out the integrand carefully, there's cancellations between, well, between different terms and diagrams, and even between different diagrams, such that this internal momenta get replaced by external momenta, and the integral becomes finite. So thus far, I, this was the motivation. So here is a bit more outline of the talk. So in particular, First part of the talk, I will focus more on the UV uh, ultraviolet status of the n equals eight supergravity theory. It's a theory we've been working on for the last uh, six or seven years. Um, and then I will tell you about uh, what, what we call a duality between color and kinematics. And this is a property of just Young Mills theory itself. Uh, but it has a very important consequence, and that consequence is that it enables us to do this double copy uh, construction of gravity. Uh, and more, more importantly, I mean, this is elegant structure, but more importantly, it enables us to calculate, gives us the ability to calculate. Because, um, you know, structure can be nice, but it's much nicer if it's useful to, you know, to calculate. So, uh, and to illustrate that, I will show some calculations we've done using this color kinematics duality. And then if I have time, I'm not sure if I have, but if I have time, I will sh tell you about some extension of color kinematics duality. In particular, what you can do is you can very nicely couple Yang Mills 
uh, theory to Einstein uh, theory, um, at least at a uh, classical level and one loop and so on. Um, all right, so let me start by reviewing uh, the ultraviolet behavior of uh, supergravity. So first of all, if you have a supersymmetric theory, it's well known that you cannot have one or two loop divergences. Uh, and this is because the possible counterterms you can write down is inconsistent with supersymmetry. And this has been argued by many people. Um, however, you can, of course, relax the, you know, you can actually go back to the bosonic theory, so just pure Einstein gravity. And then you still find that it's actually a bit more finite than you would naively expect. You find it to be one loop finite. However, this, this um, nice property de doesn't go on, and as two loop, there is a well known divergence, which was first calculated by Gorf and Sagnati um, in the 80s. Um, and if you, you want to make your life really miserable, of course, you can add matter to your theory. You no, no longer have a pure supergravity or pure gravity. And then it's well known that one loop is even divergent if you have matter. And this was famous calculation by Tuhuf and Veltman. And even for the supersymmetric theories, all of the supersymmetric theories, which has matter, which is not part of the gra graviton multiplet, they actually have divergences already at one loop, which was, was first shown by Fischler and then N equals 4 constant, contact, content. Uh, and then it was shown by also Van Evenhuysen for other supersymmetric theories. Um, but going back to the pure supergravity, uh, naively, supersymmetry has nothing against a tree loop divergence because there is a possible tree loop uh, counterterm, which is r to the 4. And r here denotes uh, the Riemann tensor. Of course, I haven't written out the indices, but they're contracted in some way. Um, so we did a, a couple of years ago, we did an explicit calculation and showed that this is tree loop finite. And then we repeated the same thing at four loops and showed that, again, it was finite. Um, and well, together, this, this two calculation, they show that there was something interesting going on, something new. And in fact, we also confirmed that there's a certain pattern um, in, in the divergence structure of this series. So it's true that these are not divergent in four dimensions, but what we, we, we did do is that we analytically continue this series to higher dimensions. And then we can show that if you only go sufficiently high in space-time dimension, there will always be a divergence, and it follows this pattern. Um, there's a slight, slight caveat at one loop, which I will not go into, but basically we have this pattern, um, which um, we showed holds up to four loops. And this actually is also a known pattern of n equals 4 uh, super yang mills theory, which is a finite theory. And you can see here that the divergence of n equals 4 super yang mills theory happens in 4 plus 6 over L dimensions. L is the loop order. And of course, if you take L to infinity, well, for any finite value of L, I should say, this is always larger than 4, which means that n equals 4 super yang mills is never divergent. It's the finite theory, as, as um, Lars showed. Um, but we also say that we also find the same pattern for n equals 8 supergravity, which is very intriguing. Um, so spurred by these calculations, there actually was a number of people who started looking at n equals 8 more carefully. And they used symmetry arguments using u-duality. And they managed to show that you can actually rule out all divergences up until seven loops. A seven loop, there's a unique candidate uh, counterterm, um, which uh, cannot be argued to be zero. Of course, it's not known whether what this coefficient is that has to be calculated. You cannot argue what the coefficient is of a counterterm. It has always to be calculated. Um, so uh, today, a seven loop calculation is not feasible, um, but it's possible that we can do a lower loop calculation, five loops, which is the next one on the list. And it's interesting that actually this seven loop divergence actually has a consequence. It actually implies a, a UV divergence of five loops in a special fractional dimension. I will come back to this late, uh, shortly. Uh, but this actually is decisive um, for what um, the divergence structure will be at seven loops. And this calculation is in progress. I will not discuss it anymore in this talk. Um, I might say something more about lower supersymmetric theories, although I might not have time, so let me do it very quickly. 
So some lower supersymmetric supergravities have also been calculated. Um, and this is actually using this color kinematics duality that I will come to shortly. Um, so in particular, n equals 4, n equals 5 has been calculated. Uh, but what's in very interesting is that although these were surprisingly well behaved, there is actually the first calculation ever of a pure supergravity theory that gave a divergence is here. So this is uh, n equals 4 at 4 loops, there is a divergence. However, the, and the divergence is very curious. It's not, it's not, it doesn't look like something you expect. In fact, it looks like it's proportional to an anomaly, which was um, a priori unexpected, although there was a nice paper here which discussed this possibility. Um, so um, it's a very nice, um, there's been some, um, well, I'm not going to go into detail, but there seem to be some connection to U1 anomalies. And I should say this U1 anomaly is in the, in the u dialis symmetry or R symmetry of, um, of um, n equals 4 theory. And uh, let me skip the next point. So instead, let, let me show you this plot here. Uh, so this plot here is to, well, first of all, compare the two theories, n equals 8 supergravity and n equals 4 cp mills. As, as discussed, there's some relation, well, there's some similarities between these theories. In particular, these are the maximally supersymmetric theories in four dimensions of a gravity and a Yang Mills theory. Um, they're unique theories, and, and both of them are very beautiful theories. Um, moreover, um, as this plot is trying to show, is that we've done a number of calculations, and every time we did a calculation, the UV behavior of these two theories agree. So I should say that this axis here has a space-time dimension, so we're doing the calculation in higher dimension. This is an eight dimension, for example, and six dimensions, seven dimensions. Um, and of course, if you go high enough in dimension, using dimensional regularization, there's always a divergence. So now we can actually not only say that both theories are finite at these low loop orders, but you can show that the explicit divergence, the, the explicit place where the divergence happens is actually the same. Uh, so in particular, for young Mills theory, we didn't, we done explicit calculation up to six loops, and for the supergravity, which is the blue dot here, only to four loops. Now, I have two curves also. So I have one curve here, the blue curve here. It's asymptotes towards four dimension. This is what you would expect from a renormalizable theory or a finite theory. Uh, it, should, it should roughly, well, it should asymptotes towards four dimension because in four dimension, uh, Yang Mills theory is renormalizable. So it should either be slightly above or slightly below the curve. QCD is slightly below, N equals four is slightly above. Um, and then I have another curve here, which is a curve which asymptotes towards two dimension. It's not so clear here, but you can guess that it continues towards two dimension. And this is a curve that you would expect naively from a theory which is normalizable in two dimensions, such as uh, supergravity. Um, naively, well, yeah. Uh, so, and what I did here is I just, I just um, basically, well, I, basically I know how this critical dimension should depend on the loop order. And then I just fudge two numbers such that uh, they agree on the last point for loop order that we did the calculation. And then you can see that, well, if you believe that n equals 8 supergravity continues to be finite, then it will continue less along this trajectory here. But if you believe that something special happens, that it starts deviating and, be and becoming more like a naive gravitational theory, then you would expect that it sort of uh, approaches this curve here, uh, or lands on this curve here. And in particular, this curve here actually intersects four dimension at seven loops, which is a, indeed consistent with the fact that here there's a, still a viable counter term. Um, and in fact, the calculation we're trying to do at five loops is trying to determine whether uh, n equals eight supergravity lies on this curve or on that curve. And these are the only two possibilities. Um, uh, it has to either be in this 26th uh, dimension or 24 fifth dimensions. And, well, the numbers are weird, but this is dimensional regularization, so never mind. Um, so now let me come to this uh, method that we use, uh, which is uh, color, what we call color kinematics duality. Um, so this is based on an observation that we did in 2008. Um, so we noticed that as, as we were doing some calculations, in, in just n equals 4 super young mills, uh, 
we noticed that there were some hidden kinematical structure, and we later identified it as being some kind of Lie algebra. And, and we also noticed that this was actually not special to the maximally supersymmetric theory, but it was, seems to be quite generic. So today we say that Yang-Mills series seem to be controlled by a hidden kinematical Lie algebra. And the best way to expose this is to write um, the amplitude in terms of cubic uh, graphs. So expand the amplitude in terms of all cubic graphs you can draw. Uh, and you write all the propagators manifestly. And you write the color factors here, which are going to be products by FABCs. So this is just going to be in the adjoint, uh, this example here. So the color factors just follows the graph structure Basically, insert an FABC whenever you see a, a tree, uh, tree glue on vertex. Um, and then there's this numerator factor, and this is the complicated function. It looks very simple here, but this is a complicated function of momenta, polarization, spinners, etc. Whatever is part of the theory. And this is this is why you know the Feynman rules go through all the you know all all the all you know all the difficulties with Feynman rules is just basically to compute this function here. The numerator. There's some symmetry factor here, but that's just a usual symmetry factor of Feynman diagrams. So what we notice that if you write it like this, we notice that well, first of all, this color factor satisfies special relations, which are not just known as the Jacobi identities, because these FABCs are not they're not unique. Um, they're not, they don't form a basis. You can actually change uh, FABCs for other FABCs, and that's just Nothing about the Jacobi identity. And of course, there's also the anti-symmetry property of the FABCs. But what we notice is that this numerator factor here, which is you know, it's just a function of momenta and you know, spinner, uh, momenta, helicity, this also seems to obey the same kind of relation. At four points, you just get it. You just look at the amplitude, and that relation is there. At higher points, it's not, so atom it's not automatic. In fact, at higher points, what you have to do is you have to enforce this relation. Um, and, <clears throat> and you cannot just read it off. You cannot just pick your favorite uh, uh, Feynman rules in some favorite gauge, uh, because this, these numerators are not gauge invariant. Um, so it's not a priori known which gauge you should pick in order to have these properties of the numerators that they should obey this relation. But it turns out if you just impose this numerator relation, this three-term uh, kinematical Jacobian entities, then uh, you can show that this enforces particular relations on the partial amplitudes. And in fact, what it does is it says that you can expand your whole amplitude as uh, an n minus three factorial basis. And um, this was proven in string theory, by the way, but let me not go into that. So, what, is this, what does this have to do with gravity? Well, so it turns out that now we have two objects. We have the color factors, which obey a Lie algebra. We have the kinematical numerators, which obey another Lie algebra. But formally, it's, just, you know, it's the same algebraic structure. It's the Jacobi identity. It's the anti-symmetry property. So the, the, the formally obey the same kind of relations. And that makes you wonder, maybe you can swap them for each other. If they obey the same algebraic relations, maybe they're interchangeable. And just doing that, Swapping a color factor for a numerator factor, well, it does something very dramatic, of course, to your amplitude. It changes the dimension. It changes the spin content of the theory. If you have spin one particle here, you'll have spin two particles here. Uh, dimension changes. You have to then multiply by some dimension for coupling constant, which I have neglected here. Uh, but basically, it smells like this it could be a gravitational amplitude. And indeed, you can show that this is indeed a gravitational amplitude. At three level, you can show that this is identical this is identical to KLT relations. Uh, at loop level, this is more than the KLT relations, so because as far as uh, we know, there's no, uh, well, nobody has constructed KLT relation at loop level. So, um, and I, this numerators, I put a tilde on one of them because in principle, they can be different. They can also be the same, and that gives n equals four times n equals four, for example, gives n equals eight supergravity, which I already mentioned. But they can be, you can reduce the supersymmetry and you can go all the way down to n equals zero, as I said. So now let me get to some examples of calculations. And well, first of all, I can, I can just mention that there's a very nice, okay. Let me uh, skip ahead because I, I think I started a bit late though. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, 
let me just, uh, I skip over that slide, but let me show you some uh, amplitudes that we calculated. So this is three loop amplitude that we calculated. It turns out that all you need to do is, you need to have one numerator factor uh, that describes um, this diagram here, this planar uh, tennis court diagram is called. Uh, this di numerator diagram here, it all, only depends on momenta. There's some supersymmetric prefactor here which I divided out, but that's just some momenta. It turns out the Jacob relation actually relates all the other diagrams to this one. So all the other numerators of all these other diagrams generated by this one. And you can compute the UV divergence, and in particular, in, in three, at three loops, the UV divergence has six dimensions. And you can show that you get this for yang mills theory. Uh, there's some integrals here, VA, VB, which are vacuum integrals. This is the planar contribution, this is the non-planar contribution. Everything is proportional to a single trace. The double trace do not appear. If you look at the gravitational UV divergence, if you find something remarkable, uh, of course, there's no separation into planar and non-planar. Everything is non-planar here. But it turns out that the, this gravitational amplitude has the same combination of integrals as this uh, non-planar young mills theory. And then we did four loops. Here is just showing the diagrams. And we actually find the same structure here, that four loops, the UV divergence of n equals four, is actually the same number in terms of uh, transcendental integrals. So these have different transcendentality. And uh, the same appears in n equals eight supergravity. So not only do they diverge at the same dimension, they also have pretty much the same number um, in these examples here. Uh, and then I was planning to say something about extension, but since I'm running out of time, I'm gonna skip that. And I'm just gonna jump to my summary. Um, so, so I showed that explicit calculations in n equals eight supergravity up to four loops show that power counting exactly follows that of n equals four super mills which is a finite theory. Uh, the five loop calculation in this particular fractional dimension will probe uh, the potential seven loop divergence. I show there is an argument you can make that these are connected. And this will uh, provide critical input to the n equals eight question. Um, the numbers, I, I was running out of time, but I briefly flashed for you the numbers here in terms of transcendental integrals. The numbers also seem to agree between n equals eight and n equals four, at least in, if you only look at the non-planar divergence in n equals four. So this suggests that there might be some deeper connection between the theories, even, you know, even perhaps after integration. Uh, and then I showed you that the method that we use is this color kinematics duality, which allows for gravity calculations of multi-loop, um, multi-point amplitudes using some, just saying most serious input. And this, of course, is greatly fac um, facilitating the UV analysis because um, even the QCD is a complicated theory, it's so much easier than you know, gravity. Um, and then, well, this is something I didn't mention, mention but let, the next, last thing is that you should stay tuned for more results because we have, we're working on the five loop and equals eight, we're working on other supergravity, so stay tuned, thank you. Actually, I'd like to ask two very general questions. Yeah. Uh, more about philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, if gravity is, in fact, uh, the square of the angle, uh, does that mean we no longer have to unify gravity with the other two attractions or not? Um, well, uh, that's a good question. Um, I think this, I mean, this, um, this construction is actually quite generic. Um, and uh, so you can construct, for example, I mean, non-unified version or unified version. So it's, uh, I think this doesn't say anything what it prefers. Um, I mean, what you, can, what you can deduce of this is actually, which I hinted to, maybe I didn't say it explicitly, but there's a deep connection to string theory, of course. So this is, I mean, this is not independent of what's going on in string theory. Okay, I think we're very late, so sorry about that.